Welcome, it's Ralph Bivens of the Ralph Bivens Project. We're here today to talk about places that are changing places that are beautiful and how to make them better and how to make the places we live better. And we're, you know, we're really happy to have Bill O, president of TBG Partners, an architecture firm that specializes in landscape architecture and, and branches of that. They do a lot of interesting things. Um, and, and he, of course, he's been a leader in our in Houston for quite some time across Texas. Their firm goes covers most of Texas, but uh, he's been head of the ULI District Council here in the past, and he's uh, chairman of the board, I believe, right now with uh, Scenic Houston. So he's, he's an active figure in the community. And uh, thank, thanks for thanks for doing the podcast, man. Well, I'm I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We have, uh, you know, his firm, his firm, uh, TGB Partners, had, had a great thing. This is, I don't usually do this, but, uh, but I, I kind of, when I read it recently, I said, I love the, the self-description of his, his company. Uh, he's the president of his company, and uh, but it's a real good description saying uh, TGB is reshaping raw space into livable space places and altering land to become meaningful landscape architecture. We're not developers, yet we can change the value of a community. We don't design shoes, but we can inspire a morning run. Though not ecologists, we can help ecosystems flourish. That's, that's a great intro. That's a great intro. The, uh, uh, oh, one, th one thing that I really, before I forget, I want to ask you about this. But, we typically think of green space and you know parks and trails and outdoor places but, but one thing that is kind of different that i've seen a lot of companies struggling with a lot of developers trying to rethink this is spaces that are that are very very urban in, in included in towers i mean how much how more urban can you get such as the you know the, the 47 story Brava residential tower that Heinz recently completed in downtown Houston. You have these the pool area, the, the this other kind of outdoor park area, I think it's on the 44th floor or something. But really fantastic. Tell me a little bit, and there's others, you know, I think you did the Thor project on Kirby Drive. Yeah, but tell me a little bit about what you do when you try to uh, create these these kind of spaces in, in these real urban environments? Well, I, I think, um, first of all, I think it's just, uh, you know, acknowledging what you even started with in regards to our description that we kind of explained who we are is that, um, you know, we are not any one of those first things that you mentioned, but we have a place in all of those. So in a way, we 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 acknowledge early in our, our firm's kind of philosophy that, you know, it takes other visionaries to collaborate with to make something great. And so when we do these projects that you just mentioned, these these high density, high rise projects, um, you know, first of all, the spaces, outdoor places that that I think um, everybody acknowledges. But sometimes I say they acknowledge in regards to when you speak about them, it's like, oh, yeah, but they don't just come out and just say, hey, did you walk down that sidewalk and how great was it? It's when they're walking down that sidewalk, they say how great that is. And I think during COVID, especially people really acknowledge the value of outdoor places, because where else do we have to go? You know, that was the only place that really was not shut down. And so I think for many, many years, we've seen high density developments like Brava that you mentioned um, and others like Kirby Collection uh, there on Kirby that, that has, you know, almost an acre sized open space on the, on the roof deck. Um, these are things that have been done for many years, but I think the value and the emphasis on those are even higher now than they were before, which is how can you still get access to that open space when you're on the 20th, 20th floor or you're on the 50th floor or the 70th floor, right? How do you still get the, that access? Um, and, and I think something else that we underestimate is that access isn't always about having a doorway that you step out and, and put your feet onto an open space or onto a green space. It's sometimes the visual side of looking through a window of glass to that space. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll shift a little bit in regards to taking it from a residential examples that, that 
you know, residential office examples that, that you shared and take it to healthcare. We, we've done a lot of, of healthcare across the country, a lot of healthcare here locally, but we have worked a lot in the pediatrics, the children's hospitals. We did the first platinum uh, certified children's hospital in Austin years ago with Dell, Dell Children's Hospital there. We did Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital in Baton Rouge and one up in New York. We've done this for a long time. And and it's interesting, this has been around for a long time, but the, the view, having the view, the access of looking from a room, a patient's room to the outdoor space is healing. It's It's been researched that it reduces the amount of medication needed by a patient by just having that access. And, you know, for many, many decades, hospitals were just the opposite. You know, if you had a window, you were lucky to look at a garage, maybe. Right? <laughs> and uh, so I think that has changed. So I think, you know, I don't think that's been the active decision on why these open spaces are being put on more of the residential and office. But I think what we try to do is educate that the value is much bigger than sometimes than even having access to it. Because many times there's fear of, well, we can have this green space, but then we have to have, you know, we have to have all this additional structural because we put people out there. And, Yes, we want access to some of those places, but I think just the value of having those green spaces at those places that are, you know, not at the ground level, extremely valuable. We try to educate our clients. We and feel happy just being able to see it. Absolutely. There's there's something that comes with that that's that's healing. I mean, in truly healing. Another important thing you do and is, uh, involves master plan communities, these large um, residential or well, they're mixed use actually, but they start off being residential, but communities that, um, that, are, that are, I know you do a lot of work in that area. What's new in the, the master plan community field? Yeah, I think um, what's new is um, what is old. <laughs> and I mean that in regards to, uh, you know, parks and open spaces have always been something that people um, want and especially within those master plan communities, which generally are out in um, green fields that are in spaces that are more in ETJ or on the outskirts of cities. Um, and so they're created from the ground up, right? The the density of homes is one thing, but I say this all the time and, and, and the developers that we work with generally acknowledge this, this is why we work with them, is that if you or I drive into any neighborhood, any master plan community, and we see a house that we fall in love with, chances are that same exact house is in 20 other neighborhoods. So are we buying the house or are we buying the neighborhood? Yeah, it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. So if you design a neighborhood that is a place that someone wants to be, that has access to trails, to open space, to, you know, to get out and have places within, you know, mixed uses within higher density components of the community, you truly create a community, not just a housing neighborhood, then that's the difference between why you live there and not live somewhere else. And I think, again, you know, all the negatives that came with 2020 and 2021 with COVID, I think open space and what we do as landscape architects and planners has been elevated. And I think as a profession, we continue to put the word out there that this is what we've been doing for decades. But this is something that I think we all as a, as a, as a human you know, society have really come to love and respect more than ever before. And um, something that someone was just telling me the other day, and it's so true. If you think 20, 30 years ago, those that were in their 50s and 60s, for them to be active in exercise was probably not necessarily as common as what you see today. I drive through my neighborhood. I look at my parents who are in their 70s. They're out walking. They're doing things that I guarantee their parents weren't doing at the rate that they're doing. So I think just as a society, the value of having access to those components is huge. And, you know, I don't want to just focus just on the master plan communities because that's that's we have the ability and the luxury to start from scratch and do it in a, in a way that's that's better out of the gate. But within the urban core, and this is one of the reasons why I'm so active in seeing in Houston, we have the opportunity to take streetscapes in the city, the pedestrian realm and improve those so that they're they're inviting and, and, and go back. And, you know, when when roadways and sidewalks have to be rebuilt, which the reality is they have to over decades. Let's build them back a different way. Let's not build them back like they were. So that's something that we pride ourselves. Build them back out. You know. Yeah. Well, what would you do to uh, change something that's a street that's been a bit with street and a sidewalk has been one way? Yeah. What, what do you? What's the way to make it better? Well, I think the couple things. One, and this is something that within Scenic Houston, we're very focused on is we've 
create a, a streetscape resource guide that's been out now for probably 10 years. We're about to issue our, our third version of that. Um, and what that has done is worked with the city to say, if you have if you have a right of way, it's a hundred foot right of way. The, the the old code and the old way of thinking was build a large median in the middle of a four lane roadway that allows you room for expansion of future lanes. Mm -hmm. And so um, what happens is we don't ever build those future lanes. So all of that green space, all that value within that right of way is really unusable from the pedestrian standpoint. So okay. one is if you have to go back and rebuild a road, how can you leverage the the right of way that's there in the middle that's not being used, turn it into lanes and push that green space outward? Um, the other thing is leverage the right of way that you have within the existing you know curb and in, in, in sidewalk areas to maximize the ability for wider sidewalks, for shade and incorporated in whether it's an urban setting, which is, requires some different types of design standards, or if it's in a more suburban setting, the same thing. So how did we leverage the space that was there that was really, honestly, you think about it, and there's nothing wrong with this, but 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it was all based on the car. So how can we, how can we reverse this, that a little bit, say, yes, the car is an important component, but how do we incorporate the pedestrian lifestyle into that? So that's something that um, is a daunting task, <laughs> and it takes organizations like Scenic Houston, it takes landscape architects like our firm, TBG, to really focus on not just getting in the habit of just going through the motion of going back and just rebuilding. Yeah, but why, yeah that, that's a great, that's a great point. I, I, you know, I've been following what's, you know, going on in the, in the city of Bel Air and Bel Air Boulevard has mm -hmm. a huge yep. that's, I don't know it, but it's got to be almost, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. nobody can get there. You know, right. got three lands on either side. There's no way for, to get there. So it, I think they have a festival somehow over there once right. a year, but otherwise it's just vacant, nothing yeah. there. It's it's green, right. yeah. green and lush, but you know, nobody can get there. Nobody can see that. And I I can really appreciate that. I, I want to go back. I want to go back. Sure. Uh, another thing that we've kind of been kicking around a little bit and seeing some new versions of as um, you, you know, you, you did this uh, with Hillwood, Perot organization and in North Texas did a project called Harvest or a community called Harvest, which yeah. uh, seemed to be very innovative and tied to agriculture, tied to uh, you know, the, <laughs> the old, old, old school land use that we, we, when we grew stuff, yeah. but making a master plan community with our, with the agricultural theme. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so Harvest was a project that we did many years ago that um, in a way was one of it, uh, the first of its kind. And, and you know, I, I'd, I'd say that we take pride that there's now several others. In fact, here even in Houston, we have a community that's very similar in structure, um, which is just to your point. It's acknowledging that um, how can we incorporate the open space into an active use that generates something besides just, you know, activity that we program for it. So, you know, where you can have community gardens and you bring people out into yards. I know at Harvest, some of the builders were one of the options instead of saying in your backyard, you can do an outdoor kitchen. Well, you could also, we'll build you an outdoor garden. That was one of the options that some of the builders in North Texas were giving. So, you know, acknowledging that, you know, having the ability to grow your own produce in your own yard, but in your own community, and then also partner with the region. So one thing Harvest did years ago is they partnered with the food bank in North Texas, where that they, you know, any any of the um, vegetables and fruits and things of that sort that they were growing, they would then share with the food bank. They would share with you know restaurants and things of that sort. And so it's another way to engage the community that's bigger than than what may be perceived as your boundaries. Um, and I think it just again it entices a different way of looking um, at options of where you may want to live and. I, I say it again, it, the homes in Harvest are no real different than any homes in the other community, but the community itself, the open space and what can be done there is different. And, and so, yeah, that's a concept that, again, we're proud to have worked on one of the very first in the country. And again, I think uh, success shows when it gets duplicated. That's a that's a good thing. Yeah, yeah well, we're, we'll see. I, I've seen some newer concepts coming out lately and, and I can't really figure out exactly what the vision is you know, wellness sort of and everything yeah. but when you try to uh, dig down 
and say, what is this going to look like? Right. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. Well, <laughs> you can see how it comes out of the ground. You know? Well, and I'll, I'll speak to that for one second. I think that um, this is something that we believe as designers and what we do is that if you're not authentic in your process, not authentic in the, in the intent, then you can quickly get into a concept. And this happens a lot when you create something that's successful. It becomes a checklist of like, OK, we gave you this, we gave you that. But if it's not truly authentic and incorporated into the, the foundational components of a community, then you can have failure even though you can have the garden or even though you can have the farm. So uh, and I'm not saying that any of those are failing, but you can you think you can fall into that quickly. We've all seen it happen. So, yeah, it's uh, that's something that can happen. The. Uh, and, and I guess uh, real quickly, but I, I th you remember reading about, the, you know, the, your project uh, that you were involved in, the, the Robbins Landing, which yep. is, mm -hmm. you know, we have to have humanity, affordable housing, but yet taking the, the it's not just uh, scattered housing you know, but, but poked around. It's actual taking the concepts that you use with master plan communities and, and, and having structure and planning on where different elements besides the houses go, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about Robin's Landing and your your work with uh, yeah, that. That's a project that um, we're super proud of, super passionate about. That's actually um, back in the, I think in 2000, maybe 14, 15, when I was chairman of ULI District Council here in Houston, that actually came through um, part of their livable places initiative and things of that sort as we were working through just partnering with other organizations like Habitat for Humanity and and Houston's Habitat, Habitat for Humanity, I think, took an approach that was unique um, where, the, to your point, most of Habitat for Humanity, based on just funding and everything else, they'll do a street of, of homes or they'll do, you know, a scattered of homes. And this was a concept where they were, had an opportunity to partner up with some land that was donated to them up in Northeast Houston to, to develop a true community. So a community like any other community that, that at market rate, where it had parks, it had trails, it had everything else. But what I love about it is that Habitat for Humanity could say, all right, we're going to build every house in here that way. What they stepped back and studied, and again, I think it's one of the first, if I'm not mistaken, in the country for Habitat to do this, is they have also built market rate housing in with it, which I think is just beautiful. And here's why I think it's beautiful. Because when we talk about affordable housing, we talk about those that need to live and be part of Habitat for Humanity. Segregating them is not the answer. Integrating them is the answer. So instead of building them in a bubble and saying, we're going to build all of these type of houses here, integrating them with market rate, where that you have everybody together, I think is a one heck of a concept that I hope gets duplicated over and over again across the country. And I think that Habitat's finding success with this or finding partners with this or finding others that they didn't know that even would partner with them because of this concept. So it's early, it's coming out of the ground. It's been a passionate project we've been working on for a number of years, and it's fun to see it come out of the ground. But I, I, I think it's going to be a home run, and I think there'll be a lot of things we can learn from it. And again, we're building an integrated community, which I think is is fantastic. We're we're looking forward to watching that grow. Yeah. The, uh, I guess right now, you know, I think you're in you know, the major city, San, San Antonio, Austin, mm -hmm. Dallas, and Houston. Uh, any plans you know, to oh, go into another market with an office? Well, I think um, as we say, we have we have Texas covered like the summer dew, like a morning dew. So we, uh, I'm not sure in Texas that there's another market that we that we necessarily need to be in. But I think we're always looking at opportunities. I mean, we we do work with about 25 percent of our backlog at least is done outside of Texas. Um, uh, most of it domestically, some of it internationally. But um, you know, we've got projects all over the Carolinas, all over the South. Um, out and in, in fact, we've got a huge project going on right now in Las Vegas. So uh, I don't know necessarily if we have a plan in place today to, to go somewhere else, but I will say this is that the world we live in today has made it much easier to not have to worry about putting a flag up or bricks and mortar, but to really be able to collaborate with our partners in other parts of the country. Um, I'll tell you this too, is and, and tell this to my partners all the time, is that um, um, be cautious of looking somewhere else because everybody's looking here, you know? And as soon as we look out somewhere else, we're going to find ourselves, you know, forgetting our own backyard. So we are a relationship business company that's been around for 36 years. And um, our founder built this on relationships. And 
you know, we pride ourselves on relationships. So we are very focused and have been since the beginning of our company to really make sure our relationships are strong. So I would say that we're probably not enticed to look too many places too far away because our relationships are so much here, but we are opportunistic like anybody else. Oh, well, I just, you know, you, you have a reputation, of course, you know, it's, it's, of being um, you know, a real leader. You know, it's obvious, you know, when you're chosen to be head of the district council the Urban Land Institute, the president or chairman of Scenic Houston, and the president of your company, uh, that you've uh, you, you, you have some leadership gifts and um, you probably have you know some philosophy and things that you rely on as as you you lead people, lead organizations. Yeah. Absolutely. No, it's a, it's important to me. I think um, one is, I think, you know, um, you know, we value and I value just, and I've been taught from this for a very early age that, um, you know, it's about relationships. It's about, um, it's about being authentic, you know, it's about being who you are. And, um, you know, I believe and have always been taught from a young age to treat others like you want to be treated. I think that's ultimately a culture we have in our company. And, um, when you go in and get involved in anything, nonprofits, for instance, and I'm involved in a lot of nonprofits, is um, do it because you want to get engaged. Don't do it because you want a resume. Um, I say it all the time. If um, to our 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 team all the time, if you are part of a any sort of organization that's outside of of, of work, um, do it only if you want to get engaged. Don't do it just because you you just you know feel as though you have to show up just because. And um, when that happens, you find yourself, <laughs> you find yourself as chair, you find yourself in those other kind of positions, but that's okay because now you have the opportunity to help lead and you have to really believe in what the organization's about. And, you know, I, I've been involved in many nonprofits, been involved in many chairman's positions for a lot of those organizations. And I, 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 I love them because I love what they believe in and, and I take pride in helping move that needle just a little bit and handing that baton to somebody else. And, uh, that's a philosophy again that we have as a company and um, you know we we focus on leadership training across the company we are CMO senior level uh level leaders um we have a trainership program that they they work with they have a mentor they work with a coach um we have leadership retreats that we have at all of our different levels from staff all the way to our principal level every year where we have a leadership consultant come in and and really help everybody learn to just be better leaders and you know be leaders of people. And um, uh, I would love to say that everybody's born to be a leader and that's not true, but uh, everybody can be taught traits on how to be a better leader. And that's something that um, I think uh, if you are are open enough to acknowledge that you need to be a better leader, then you'll be a better leader. Uh, if you don't acknowledge that, then it's really hard to be a better leader. So that's something I think that our firm, that's again, a foundational piece of our, our culture and something that, um, as we go for the next several generations, I think it's something that will always be part of our foundation. But, uh, if, you know, they for, for a younger person, uh, it's just developing their career and everything, what, what kind of, and they think, well, I may have some leadership skills. Yeah. Cool. What do you? What kind of advice would you? Yeah, give? I, get, I get asked that question a lot. I I, I always say, um, find something that you have an interest in, and um, be inquisitive about it. Um, that's something that we 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 literally when we hire individuals, we look for folks that are inquisitive. Um, I I uh, I sometimes get um, I get folks that laugh because I I. I I ask a million questions because I always am inquisitive and, and that's a good trait and we look for that. And so I just say, find something you're interested in and start asking questions. And if it's something that you want to know more and more about, then raise your hand and get involved. And um, it's that simple. It really is not any harder than that. But if you just go out and feel like you have to jump into something with no interest, don't ask any questions, not inquisitive. Um, even if you get involved, you're not going to be fulfilled. And, um, I, I believe and I lead at TBG this way that um, we're only as good as the person to our right and to our left. And at the end of the day, if you are not moving towards something that you're passionate about and fulfilled, then you're not going to be at your best. So, um, you know, and, and you and I both know this, Ralph, at, at a young age, we are passionate about one thing. And I promise you at the age that we're at, it's a different thing, right? And so it doesn't ever end. You have to keep asking those questions and finding those things. 
and I take with, you know, I, I, I believe a big thing, the thing, the characteristic that I kind of always associate with you is, you know, this, the importance of authenticity. Mm -hmm. You've said that, you mentioned that, and, you know, I see that in the way uh, you talk and what your firm does and what uh, you've accomplished, that, that authenticity is uh, a huge, huge item. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, uh, last question, and I know we're running, we're out of time, but last question is just, I, I think that you've uh, been doing some work with, you know, kind of uh, park or play areas, I guess, that, that are more inclusive to the, um, a broad set of people can, can mm -hmm. participate in. Can you tell me a little bit? About that, yeah, ab absolutely. It's a, it's a, something that we've been doing for a number of years, but I think um, it has picked up a, a huge following right now. And it's um, I think we're we're learning to get out and, and speak more about this. But it's, it's inclusive, fully inclusive play, which is um, having play that is available for all, no barriers. Um, and there's a fine line there. It doesn't mean that we go pull out a catalog and we find the pieces of equipment that actually are for those that have disabilities that they can use. That's that's kind of been a the playground industry standard is, oh yeah, we have that inclusive play, just pull these pieces of equipment. But inclusive play is that, again, it's not segregated, it's integrated. Um, we have the um, we have a few employees in our company who have, who have children, who have raised children with disabilities, and um, they have lived that world of, oh, here's your inclusive play over in the corner. And that's, um, that's, that's not truly helping their children. And so we have really made a huge focus on making sure that everything that we're doing, that we're always thinking of that, where we have a client that says, we want to be really, really focused on full inclusive play. We just make sure that that is an integrated play within, yes, we may have more inclusive components, but it's gonna be inclusive at all levels, not just at a level of need that, that may be on their list, but a truly integrated design. And um, we have um, just recently won some wonderful projects in Austin and in North Texas that are are, are are fantastic opportunities to just show that show this as an example. And so uh, it's, it's something that I think we're very proud of right now and, and very passionate about. That's a wonderful thing for this show. Yeah, absolutely. Bill Odell, BBG, thank, thanks for your time. And uh, we'll, we'll, let's talk again sometime. That sounds great. I look forward to it. Thanks, Ralph. Appreciate it. Thank you, my friend.